and turn it over to Alice Howard to introduce our speaker. Thanks everybody for coming. Uh, hello everyone, I'm Alice Howard, RPA board member, and I've been organizing these lectures for a number of years. So welcome to the second RPA lecture this year. All our talks in this series uh, will explore conservation issues that impact us. Tonight we're going to hear about forest regeneration. Next month uh, it will be conserving habitats and wildlife. And future topics will include water resources and air quality, flood water management, clean energy and climate solutions, uh, and others. Uh, it looks to be a pretty interesting year, so I hope you all will continue to join us on the third Thursday of the month, 7 p.m. on Zoom until further notice. Tonight, it's my great pleasure to introduce Peter Smallage. He's a recognized authority and researcher about woodlands, and we'll be interested to hear his views on the concerns and risks for our forests and some options for addressing these. So, Peter. Go ahead. Great, thank you, Alice, and thank you, Jim. It's a pleasure to be able to join you all by Zoom. Uh, in person is always more fun, but given the circumstances, we'll take what we can get, and everybody has less travel time if we do it by Zoom. So, um, as Alice indicated, and in, in, uh, Jim and I have been corresponding, and Al Alice and I have been corresponding as well. Um, I'm going to be talking about a, a topic that I've been spending a lot of time focusing on in the last mm, at least decade, if not more, uh, probably closer to 20 years, and, and giving kind of a broad um, picture about forest regeneration, looking at it from an ecological perspective as well as from a management perspective, and keeping in mind that there are uh, the solutions that we have oftentimes depend upon the size of the properties that we're working on. So um, let me see if I can share my screen. There we go. There we are. Had to find the right right file. All right, um, is everybody seeing just a single slide? I don't, so I can't see your faces anymore. I've lost faces. Actually, let me uh, stop sharing for just a minute. I want to turn Peter. my video. Single, single Peter, slide. you're good. All right, okay, good, thank yep. you. Yeah, I was muted, so I can't. No, that's okay. I've done that before too. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to be talking the title, official title, if you want one, is uh, Woodlot Regeneration, Growing Trees and Limiting Deer Damage. This is a presentation that I developed with a colleague of, my, Brett, colleague of mine, Brett Chedzo, who I've worked with for many years, and uh, he's a regional extension forester in the south central Finger Lakes region. It also is the manager at the R Not Teaching and Research Forest. Um, so I think it's fun to start off by recognizing that we have very beautiful forests in New York. And these are pictures from the R Not Teaching and Research Forest, which is a Cornell facility. And for me, it's just, you know, I can look at this and you could look at this. And I think any of us, because of the time we've all spent in the woods, you could just start telling stories about what you see or about what you don't see or about what you like, what you might, you know, what you think could be done differently, um, whatever it might be. Um, the point here is that we have beautiful forests, they have lots of stories to tell, but as we'll see in a minute, these forests are in many cases aging and maturing, and it's not without some additional risk. And this is from a New York State DEC the FRAS is the Forest Resources Assessment um, Survey. It's a summary report, and they reported that New York forests are changing and without intervention on many fronts. will change, our forests are gonna change, and the amenities and benefits that they provide are gonna be altered in very profound ways. And we can see that if you look closely at this picture, we see the beauty of fall color, 
We see uh, in the foreground, we see some invasive shrubs. Those are mostly autumn olive. In the background, we see additional fall color, but also some conifer plantations. And so the, for the kind of the message here is that the forests that we currently have are going to change. The question is whether they're going to change and be replaced by forests that provide us with the same kind of, of benefits and values that we want to have. We got interested in this, um, well, some of us here, myself and Gary Goff, Goff and Paul Curtis started thinking about this in the late 90s. And we worked with the Human Dimensions Survey Unit at Cornell and we did a survey of foresters and we asked them this question, you know, the last time you were in a, in a woodlot or in a forest that should have regenerated, did it regenerate? And you can see that only 30% of the foresters reported a successful, a highly or moderately successful regeneration. So that means that 70% of the forest that they had been in that should have regenerated did not regenerate. So that really made us think, uh, what is it that we're dealing with and how are we going to manage these problems? At the same time, there was a study by the Nature Conservancy uh, exactly the same time frame, the, the late, early 2000s and, and published in 2010, their methodology was a survey of permanent plot data that's collected by the U.S. Forest Service, the FIA data. And what they found was that there was good and very good regeneration, the, the two green colors, um, only in about, um, I've got the statistics later, I think about 40 or 42 percent of the occasions or, or situations in their, on their database. And so they had a slightly more generous definition of regeneration than we did. We were a little more rigid about it. But the, the messages in both cases were, were less than half of what should be regenerating is regenerating. So that's a concern. What I want to talk about today is we'll go through the ecology of regeneration, look at uh, some concerns and risks, uh, look at some of the barriers to forest regeneration, uh, think about how we can establish trees and how we can protect the seedlings. And these two pictures illustrate, uh, on the surface at least, illustrate what's good about forest regeneration. Uh, the reality is that, especially that picture in the bottom, that forest has looked just like that for the last 20 years. There's been no height growth on those sugar maple seedlings. So the ecology of northeastern forests is all about sunlight. And a lot of times I think about, uh, as forest managers and woodlot owners, we're not really managing trees, we're managing which trees get sunlight and which trees are able and survive uh, in getting sunlight. So when we want to regrow another forest, I'll talk about why we need to do that. Uh, when, we, when we're trying to regrow another forest, um, there are questions we need to ask related to which seedlings get sunlight. So we say, how many seedlings do we need? And when do we need them? So if we think about a forest as a, as a community of, of individual stems, and that eventually that community senesces and can be replaced either on a small scale or a large scale, when in that lifespan of that community of trees do we need those seedlings to show up? What species are appropriate? What are the barriers to getting them to establish? So getting the seeds on the ground and then the seeds to germinate and, and then eventually grow. And then what actions are associated with either with increasing the success on these um, on these efforts for regeneration? Um, what we also know is that um, some plants don't need much sunlight, and the there are, some of these are desirable plants like sugar maple. There are other plants that are include essentially all of the invasive plants, herbaceous, so forest invasive plants, herbaceous, woody shrubs, vines, and um, small trees do not need much sunlight to survive, and there are native species such as American beech. So as long as we are not managing sunlight and not managing vegetation, there are still opportunities for these plants to dominate in the understory and become abundant to the point of causing complications. Um, so why do we need regeneration? 
and we can think about the last 150 years or so, we can go back to the late 1800s. This was at a time when the forests of New York and most of the Northeast were largely unforested. And I don't have any pictures of the late 1800s, but the, the picture on the far left is kind of, a, of an agricultural setting, maybe like we, uh, I, I imagine at least some of these early farms had, and probably there's a lot more forest than what those farms in the 1800s had. But as agriculture started to decline in New York for a number of reasons, forests started to regrow. And so in the early 1900s, we had a, an explosion of juvenile forests develop. These are, are woodlands that have a high density of small diameter stems. And once those stems are established and the canopy closes, it pretty much shuts down additional recruitment of plants. Uh, as those as those young forests matured, we got into the mid to late 1900s. The number of stems declines, but the size of those stems expands. And then, in the last 30 years, we've had a number of circumstances where we have opened up the canopy. It's either been through forest harvesting for, you know, because of deliberate efforts that we take on with our forester, or it may be as a salvage or pre-salvage or pre-sanitation for insect pests such as the emerald ash borer, which is pictured on the far right-hand side. So we have these forests in New York that have, that have been um, developing over the last 150 years. And when we look at the lifespans, the, the normal lifespans, not the maximum lifespans, but the normal lifespans of many of our in, in a lot of these, for a lot of these species, a lot of them have dropped out. Paper birch has dropped out. In many cases, aspen has dropped out. Uh, and, and the longer-lived species are also starting to get to, a, to upper ages. So we need to think about how do we regenerate, and then when we want, if, if we commit ourselves, and I'm not saying you have to regenerate. I, I'm not dictating anything about the management that you undertake. So this is all under the premise of if you want to regenerate, then you want to be focused on two things. You want to focus on composition, which is what is present, and you want to focus on what it looks like, which is how many stems and how big are those stems, and what's the variation and the size of those stems. So when we talk about forest regeneration, we need to know the composition and the structure. When I say composition and structure, I'm talking about what species are present and how many stems, usually how many stems are there. Species composition depends on a lot of things. You can see the list, uh, and, and it's, um, it's very tightly related to seed source. Uh, that's a, a key determinant. If you don't have oak in the overstory, you're not gonna have any or not very much oak in the understory. There are selective pressures. It might be browsing or drought conditions or uh, seasonally flooded soil conditions or a cool aspect or a dry aspect, um, recent uh, land uses or historic land uses. All these things can influence what species are present. The structure of the number of stems um, depends upon having uh, an adequate supply of seed and an adequate, adequate supply of sunlight. And what's most important, uh, I, I'm not I'm gonna talk less about how do we get those high numbers because if you give sunlight, then you can get those high numbers and good seed rain. But what's important is if you look at the chart on the left, that's a, it's called a stocking chart, and I'm not gonna go into the details of it, but I just want you to look at those two green lines. And the green line on the right, um, the upper end terminates on a diagonal line that's labeled as three at the top, so an average tree diameter of three. The green line on the left terminates at an average tree diameter of four. And if you look down at the bottom, you can see that the, the three inch average diameter is associated with 1,400 trees per acre and the four inch average tree diameter is associated with 900 trees per acre. This is, I don't say a lot of things are set in stone, um, but this is something in forestry that is pretty close to set in stone. And that is in a very general principle, the numbers may vary, but in a general principle, a young forest is gonna have thousands of trees per acre. And as that forest matures, the numbers have to decline. And if you wanna have a well-stocked stand, so you have plenty of trees, to make decisions with at the time of maturity, then you have to start with a large number of stems. There's just no other way around it. 
So the number of stems is important. Um, the co-author and I, uh, Brett Chedzoy, wrote an article a couple uh, months ago that talks about forest regeneration and determining adequate stocking because quite frankly, we were out with foresters that should know better that were talking about woodlands that were regenerated. And in fact, they had a few desired seedlings, but they were not anywhere close to adequately regenerated. And some people say, well, I'm not planning to harvest trees. Why do I need to think about forest regeneration? Because there are natural events that happen uh, regularly that will, that will alter the light regimes. Now, do you need to pay attention to forest regeneration? No, uh, but if you don't, there something when you give uh, put more sunlight on the forest floor, something will regenerate. It might be ferns, it might be grasses, it might be multiflora rose, it might be uh, northern red oak and uh, eastern white pine. So there are things like ice storms and emerald ash borer and hemlock woolly adelgid, and that that are killing um, events. There are stressor events, just more chronic stressors like forest tent caterpillar and drought, and there's wind. These are all things that are independent of harvesting, but yet impact the sunlight levels. So the point of this is, this first section is that northeastern forests are mature, and that when canopies are disturbed, that upper layer of vegetation is disturbed, sunlight increases on the forest floor and it stimulates the regeneration of something. The future forest, what comes back in the presence of all that sunlight, depends upon what survives in the understory. So we have to ask ourselves these questions. If we have these disturbances in our canopy, will mature woodlands regenerate? And I'll repeat the evidence I stated early, earlier that there's very weak, if any, evidence for successful regeneration. The Nature Conservancy found 43% good or very good. We found 30% highly or moderately uh, successful in its regeneration. And a recent study found that less than one third of permanent plots were regeneration ready. So. This is, in my mind, if, if we know what we're doing and we should know what we're doing, uh, we're not very successful at what we're trying to accomplish. In our study, we went on and asked those foresters as part of the survey, what are the factors that limit the success of regeneration? And across the board, uh, almost across the board, the majority of problems were associated with deer. So statewide, that average 65% of the foresters said, Deer were the, were the primary limiting factor. Uh, in other areas, so others like lower Hudson Valley and the Lake Plain, the Southern Highlands is from Delaware County across to uh, Chautauqua County, 59%. Uh, the Adirondacks, we'll talk about that in a minute, was a little bit lower. Interfering vegetation, native or non-native, was common and fairly consistent throughout the state. So let's first look at the impact of deer and what deer can do. For any of you who've raised livestock, you know that livestock have set um, energy consumption needs. Uh, we had a goats in the woods project at the Arnott Forest 20 years ago, and I know that if we give goats a total mixed ration of two pounds, they're gonna do fine, but that's highly nutritious. Deer need on average about seven pounds of fresh weight per day. And so when they're accumulating that fresh weight, I've got three different pictures here that, sh that show what they're nipping off. They're not eating the entire plant, they're just taking off the tips. So either small seedling or tips. There are about 600 seedling tips per pound, and you can do that math, seven times 600 is about 4,200 seedlings per deer per day. Uh, this will vary a little bit through the season, and it varies a lot if there's agriculture or gardens, as Alice was talking about earlier, uh, that will supplement the deer. But an individual deer is going to have, let's just say that's half right, and it's 2,100 seedlings per deer per day. If you have one deer or two deer in, you know, in a few hundred acres, that's not such a big deal. But if you have tens or scores of deer uh, in an area, then you, you can imagine all they're doing day in and day out is eating tree seedlings. We set out to uh, document this, and this was a study that uh, Mike Ashdown was the technician on, Paul Curtis was leading it and I was supporting. And we put in fences in areas to evaluate a protocol that we developed called Abbott. I'll mention that in a minute, but let me just 
talk you through the data. So our, you know, one of the more desirable species we have is sugar maple, that's the orange color. And you can see from 2016 to 2019, the average height of those plants has essentially declined. They started off at about 7.4 inches and ended up at about 6.7. So that's not a huge decline. You could say, well, there's, and, and there was a fair amount of shade in this area, but when you can compare that, those were unprotected. If you compare that to sugar maple seedlings in adjacent to the orange seedlings, and that, that represents 30 or 40 tagged seedlings, so we knew exactly what they were doing. The gray bar is sugar maple that's inside a fence, and that went from about seven inches, peaked out at about 13 and a half, and then dropped down to about 12 inches. There was a, a drought, as I recall, in 2018 that we had some dieback. But the slope of that line, or the growth rate, of those sugar maple inside the fence is equal to the slope of the line or the growth rate of the blue bar, which is hop hornbeam. Hop hornbeam or ironwood is, it's a fine tree. It's got a really nice hardwood. I've, I've turned it on a lathe to make mallets for woodworking, but from a forest um, economic and ecologic perspective, it doesn't have a lot to offer. But in the absence of a fence, Hop hornbeam is growing as nicely as sugar maple is inside of a fence. So deer are selectively removing species that we would typically prioritize and, um, and allowing to grow less desirable species. That was in St. Lawrence County. There's a fair number of deer per acre. And you could say, well, what happens when you have really low deer density? Well, if you have really low deer density, and there's also nothing for them to eat, which is the case in many of our forested landscapes. The example here is from the Tug Hill, the Western Adirondacks, where there's about eight deer per square mile. This was a study that Paul Curtis and I did um, in the, we started it in the late 19, or late 20, late, you know, just before like 2009, 8, 2008, 2009. I was doing a beach management project. He was looking at forest regeneration in the, in the presence of deer, and you can see the fenced exclosure. So the fenced exclosure is regrowing yellow birch. You can see it's like one of those, one of those uh, like whatever cart, you know, animals they have at Walt Disney World where they trim the bushes. The deer have pruned the vegetation back to the edge of that fence. In the absence of protection, you get ferns back. Now they have at eight deer per square mile, it's very few deer, but if there's nothing else for the deer to eat, and if you give them a small opening, it's going to concentrate the deer in that small opening, and they're going to have a profound impact. There are areas in the upper elevations of the Adirondacks where you have winter kill, heavy winter snowfall, uh, and the option for winter kill. This is on industry land, and uh, they put in a checkerboard of 24 acre clear cuts because it's that land is restricted by the Adirondack Park Agency clear cut sizes. This was an area that was dominated by beech and red maple and birch and cherry. They did the clear cut and it came back to that same mix of species. It was not particularly dominated by anything and there was an adequate number of desirable species. So if you have a large uh, area that you can harvest in low deer density, you can overwhelm the deer. Uh, most people can't put in, and this they put in like 15 or 20, 24 acre patch cuts with an equal number of uncut areas. So this is a fairly intensive harvesting system. You might ask, well, but aren't the hunters going to control the deer? These are a uh, picture, picture of some friends of mine from, it's scary to think, 17 years ago and they're all 17 years older than they were. There's fewer hunters, we're all aging. I don't know about you, but when I go out and hunt, I'm a lot less aggressive and I have less time to spend in the woods. Uh, there's a report from Michigan that there's a, about a 20% decline in the number of hunters between the late 1990s and a couple of years ago. So even if hunters were successful, there's fewer of them, but hunters struggle to be successful. And this is, and I'm, this is in no way saying that uh, I have any problems with hunting. I'm an, I'm an avid hunter. Hunting is an important part of our legacy with the land. But when you look at this 
um, generalized population uh, graphic of deer, if you start off with two deer, and this means that there are, and, and this generalization means there's no immigration, no emigration, no mortality, and the population growth um, or limits on population growth, you start off with two deer, the next year you get four deer, and then the year after that you're up to six deer, and by year seven you're up to 40 deer. That's a 1900% increase in seven years. So every year you are reproducing almost, you're generating almost a 50, on average, a 50% increase in the herd every year. So if you just want to keep that herd stable, you have 50% of the deer herd needs to die, either by hunting or by cars or by saber-toothed tigers, whatever. That's a, that's a high mortality rate. Hunters cannot kill that many deer. So now let's turn to interfering vegetation. Um, I want to start by just kind of defining some terms. We often hear about invasive plants, and that has a legal definition in New York. It has two components to that definition. One is that it interferes with human societal objectives, and that they are legally non-native. Um, so they did not originate in New York, or have no original historic uh, context for that. Um, most exotics are, or non-natives are not invasives. So corn is an example, apple trees is another example. These are exotics, they're not invasive. Many exotics are beneficial. Um, and there are some native species in addition that act like invasive species and in that they cause problems. So because of that, I lump all of these problem plants under the label of interfering vegetation because they interfere with what we want to accomplish. And those interfering vegetation are advantaged by the presence of deer. So usually when we have a plant problem, it's because we already have a deer problem. And so managing your plant, plant problem without a deliberate strategy to manage the deer is not going to be very successful. So not only you have to, but that said, if you, even if you take out the deer, you can have legacy effects. So the, the, the longevity of these plants can sustain. One of our most concerning plants is American beech. It's a beautiful species. And right now it is the most common species in the sapling layer. So saplings are stems that are between one inches and five inches in diameter. As of 2012, they're the most abundant. And over the, and between 2007 and 2012, there was a 14% increase. So that, that number 978 in the millions is just shy of a billion beech stems in New York. And I reviewed a research publication that looks at the next five years and between 2007 and 2017, beech saplings increased by 17%. So the problem is not going away. Our next forest in the absence of intervention is going to be a beech dominated forest. The species that we like, red maple, sugar maple, see these are five most common saplings. The only other one that's increasing is balsam fir. And for many people, I like balsam fir. A lot of people, there's, there's not a, a lot of economic opportunity there. So this combination of deer and shade is troublesome. You see on the far left, the control. And these were small 10 foot by 10 foot plots. Control where there is no treatment, had a very low regeneration of desirable and undesirable stems. So these are stems that are between uh, about a foot tall and about three feet tall. If you just cut it, nothing happens. The deer, because it's a small area, the deer will annihilate everything that grows back. If you just fence it, you do pretty well. And if you cut everything and fence it, then you have a pretty good response. So you manage the sunlight and exclude the deer. So there were, this is leading us down a pathway of what we need to do. The cutting it, the forest harvesting practices are important because it's tempting to do what's called selective harvesting, where we say, I'm just gonna cut the biggest trees. They surely those are the oldest trees, and therefore I want to let those uh, younger trees live. So that makes the assumption that these smaller trees are actually younger trees. What happens though is that forests will stratify or they'll develop layers and we have this upper layer of trees that have crowns that are exposed to sunlight. Those are the blue crowns that you see and then we have a lower layer or the, the, the sub canopy 
that are not exposed to sunlight. They have smaller crowns, less foliage. And if you give those smaller trees more sunlight, they're not gonna grow as fast as if you give those upper crown, upper canopy trees more sunlight. In fact, the upper canopy trees will grow three to eight times faster than the lower canopy trees. And that's just because they have more foliage. They may also be genetically um, superior because if these forests are even aged, which they are, then there's some, there's some reason why those bigger trees are bigger than the smaller trees are small. And that's because we have even age forests that have regenerated following agriculture and diameter does not predict age. So this slide and the next slide are the kind of the two key take home messages if you remember anything, size does not predict age. And you look at this forest, this is that area that I showed you that early on, the sugar maple seedlings, carpet, the forest floor, this is in the fall, so much of that foliage is gone. You see lots of tree sizes, the blue, tree on the far right is, an, is a red oak tree that was on an old farm trail. At the far side of the picture, you can't see it, there's a stone wall. This is an old agricultural field. There was a hedgerow of red oak and sugar maple. This seeded in to an even aged forest of sugar maple, all different sizes, all the same age. And it was most profound to me, and this was about 10 years ago, and this was on Brett's property. He had a harvest and we were out there with a group and um, we, somebody said, oh, well, this, this uh, little stem here, the one on top of the big stem is a, was a sugar maple. Surely this is younger. Well, that sugar maple stem was about six inches sitting on about a 30 inch diameter red oak stem. They were both about 90 years of age. I counted the rings. There was one other person that counted the rings. I would not have guessed that that smaller stem would have been the same age. But the, the, the moral here is that if you think about any collection of biological organisms, take a classroom with sixth graders, individuals are gonna grow at different rates. So you walk into a sixth grade classroom and you've got big kids and little kids, tall and short, and they're all the same age by and large. Uh, and you know, the same thing happen. You go next time you go to a party and, and it's all like, you know, people of your age, look around, there, there are people of very different sizes. And think about it also, when you go to that sixth grade classroom or that, that Thanksgiving holiday party that you're gonna have, you're all the same species. When you go into the forest, you may have four or six or eight different species that will all inherently grow at different rates. So we have understories that are developing beneath our mature forest canopies. The deer browse them, and they selectively favor typically undesirable species. And those undesirable species are dominating. So if we want to regenerate, how do we do it? We need to manage sunlight. I'm gonna talk just very briefly about tree planting because it's expensive, it's very expensive, and it's an awful lot of work. The key here is you have to match the species to the soil and you have to be prepared. This was a research trial that I did looking at different tree tubes. We had pre-sprayed to control competing the interfering vegetation. This, in this case, it was uh, pasture grasses, and we had tree tubes to protect, and we knew the soils, and we picked species to match the soils, and then we maintained that vegetation through mowing and spraying for the next seven years. There are different price points that you can um, work with. The wire cage on the left tends to be inexpensive in terms of out-of-pocket cost, but it requires some labor on your part. Um, the plastic tubes run anywhere from four to five dollars a piece and they have to be staked and maintained. All of these require maintenance, which is often the maintenance is more expensive than the actual implementation. More commonly in New York in the Northeast, we do what's called natural regeneration. So we manage sunlight either at a small scale for uneven age systems. So we have patchworks of different ages of openings, or we have large scale openings uh, that are even aged systems. So an uneven age system is either single tree or group selection. You can see the group selection has a greater diversity of tree species by the colors. I'm using those to symbolize different tree species. More sunlight, you can accommodate a greater variety of tree species. This is a group selection. Genesee County is up near Batavia towards the kind of west of Rochester. Uh, this was an effort 
to try to regenerate black cherry, which usually I would not think about regenerating black cherry in a group selection because it's intolerant of shade, but that was, that was what was being attempted. And they got black cherry started, whether or not it succeeds or succeeded, I don't know. I'm not, uh, so I think uneven age systems are fascinating. They work, when they work, they can work, but when they don't work, um, it's hard to get them to work. Um, the concerns that I have is that when you make these small openings, if deer are a problem, the deer are going to be concentrated. Uh, and you can leave slash behind, as you see in this picture, but um, that usually is not particularly effective. You also, by the nature of uneven aged forest management, you go in and you're working in these areas every 10 or 15 years, so there's a potential for injury to stems. You're not going to largely regenerate early successional species such as paper birch and quaking aspen and black cherry, uh, some of those species which may be not of concern to you, but there will be reduced species, species diversity and it's a more complex system to apply. So you need somebody that's familiar with those details. Even aged systems include clear cutting, seed tree, shelter wood, uh, and coppice. And coppice is just where you cut the trees and let them sprout. The other three our clear cutting is a very extensive disturbance seed tree. So clear cutting essentially you cut everything in a single entry. So you go in, cut everything. It, it has limited, there are limited circumstances when that's going to be effective, but it can be effective. Seed tree is what you see in the foreground. You're using those seed trees to throw seed, to regenerate shelter wood. We're going to see pictures of, but essentially you have two or three times as many residual trees left after that, after that first entry for both seed tree and shelter wood, then 10 or 15 years after the initial harvest, you go back in and do an overstory removal after the next forest is fully established. So we tried at the Arnott Forest uh, some seed, some strip clear cut. So these are 100 feet wide. Technically it's a uh, strip clear cut with residual. You can see that tree with the red paint band in the middle. And the, the expectation was that we would get seed rain from the, from the adjoining edges that would establish in these clear cuts. So we came in, it was cut in 2005, this was 2006. 10 years later, this is what it looks like. For those of you good with your tree ID, you'll recognize in this picture we have some aspen and some birch. And then we went in a year ago and we have 100% pin cherry, aspen, and beech. So clear cutting was a reasonable strategy to use here. Um, I'll say in a, in, a, in, a, in a theoretical way, uh, but the outcome, the, the reality was it failed. So this is on the Arnott Forest. We have to generate our own budget, and my job is to make sure that the, that the director of the Arnott Forest in 60 or 70 years is gonna have something valuable to harvest. So this is not going to provide any future, any significant future income. Um, there are also seed tree harvests and shelterwood harvests. We had tried those with uh, equally poor results. So you want to use even age systems when you have tree species or wildlife species that require full sunlight, when you want a contiguous homogeneous habitat. Some people like that, some people don't. Um, it may be that you have a low site quality in that the productivity of that site can't support frequent repeated entries. It's simpler to use. Um, and then because you go in and you do your initial harvesting and then you don't re-enter for another 50 or 60 years, you can better regulate residual damage. So how do we successfully regenerate? We have to do three things. We talked about these before. We have to main, know what our seed source is. Uh, and that's through a practice of that's whatever the management has been up until this point in time. We're not going to get into those. That's a couple of lectures in and of itself. We have to illuminate, so we have to put sunlight on the forest floor, and then we have to protect the seedlings. So we're going to we're going to focus primarily on the protection, but also get into some of the illumination. The illumination is not only uh, opening up the canopy, but also maybe doing something to manage the understory, such as you see that fern cover, whatever that interfering vegetation layer might be. So fencing will work. We did an experiment 
Uh, we're wrapping it up right now. We looked at two different inexpensive fencing options. We tried high tensile, eight foot high, high tensile wire, and we tried five foot high black plastic mesh. I'll show you the data in just a second. The high tensile fence does not work. Um, the black plastic mesh will work, and you're saying, wait, it's only five feet tall. Deer can jump that. Deer can easily jump eight feet. They're more likely to go under, which is what they did on the, on the high tensile fence. If it's a small enough area, and these systems work, for probably about a quarter of an acre to a third of an acre. So if you want to do a small patch cut, this might be a viable option. The tools that you need, actually, I guess I took the data slide out. Across the state, the mesh was superior to the, to the high tensile, which was barely better than nothing at all. It's fairly simple tools. The cost of installation is a little higher than 50 cents per foot, and that includes labor. If you pay your nephew $15 an hour it works out to be about 50 cents a foot for materials and labor. You do have to maintain it. If you go on to larger acreages you're going to need a bigger fence because it's a more there's a greater incentive for the deer to get in. The smaller areas the deer feel confined and so a lower fence will keep them out. This was a 30 acre harvest we did in our sugar bush at the Arnott Forest. We put up a seven and a half foot mesh uh, with a one foot apron on the bottom. And you can see in the picture on the left, there's an offset strand uh, that's electrified about 30 inches off the ground. There's lots of BMPs to think about. I'm not gonna, I don't have time to go into these. Um, if you're interested in putting in one of these higher fences, let me know the cost to install it was about $4 a foot. That's just the installation. Then we have people, we have staff that walk the fence every week. The first 52 weeks, there were two weeks they did not have to make some kind of a repair. So repairs were common, and the repairs would take anywhere from four to eight hours to repair it. So you're you're looking at something on the order of two to two to three days per month of labor involved in maintaining the fence. The removal costs are on the order of about a dollar a foot. So at some point you would re remove the fencing. Now you're looking at about a dollar a foot. People talk about brush piles. Uh, brush piles can exclude deer. I think that they're going to be most effective when you can have brush piles on top of already established seedlings. Uh, brush rots very quickly. I'll show you our data on that in just a few minutes. And if you don't have seedlings on the ground and you just put down a pile of brush, by the time the seeds find that pile of brush, they germinate, they start to grow, the brush has started to decay enough that it offers very little protection to those seedlings. The other thing is that you don't, it's almost impossible to get full stockings. So to get that density, the number of stems, number of seedlings per acre that you need is almost impossible to do uh, with brush piles, just because you don't have access to that much brush. So we were looking at, um, we were thinking about the efforts that we had done at the Arnott Forest where we had failed in some textbook perfect civil cultural operations for regeneration. And we looked at what was happening in Pennsylvania and we said, well, you know, their fencing works. Maybe we'll just bite the bullet and do an installation. Uh, we talked to some people that do fencing and, and foresters and what have you in Pennsylvania. And that's not an inexpensive effort. And the maintenance, though, is what was was a killer for us because the first harvest we were planning, so the Arnott Forest is 4,000 acres, we'll manage big chunks at a time. The first regeneration cut we were gonna do was about 60 acres and it had 6,000 feet of perimeter. So that's, that's, a, that's a full day for some person to walk around that and then they have to go back and make repairs. So we came up with this idea of slash walls. In the remaining few minutes, I just want to go quickly through what we've learned with slash walls. Slash walls happen when you're doing a regeneration harvest. So when you're in thinning or tending, it's, that's not when you would put in a slash wall. The slash walls go to, at a time when you say, I'm ready to convert this mature forest to an immature forest. And it's done by piling the slash at the perimeter of the harvest. So if you have the 20 acre, and we've got these from six acres up to 160 acres. 
you pile the slash at the perimeter, I'll show you how that happens. The picture on the right shows my hat dangling from a branch. You get the idea that this is an impenetrable collection of woody debris. And I've climbed over one slash wall once and I won't do it again because it just scares the daylight out of me. Um, but they're effective. So the progress to date, and you can keep track of what we're doing at www.slashwall, single, singular, not plural, slashwall.info. We've completed nine harvests um, in the last three years, uh, four years, and we've uh, installed 51,000 linear feet of slash wall. Um, the harvest range from, that's actually incorrect, from six up to 160 acres. Now what we're looking for is what are the deer impacts? Can slash walls exclude deer? How long do the slash walls last? Because they're going to degrade, we know that. And what happens to beach? So I, we, we kind of talked about beach and then we stopped talking about beach, but beach is for us is a real problem. And historically what we've done is spend um, anywhere from 150 to, that was 15 years ago for herbicide treatment. Now the prices for herbicide treatments are well over $200 an acre. Are there other things that we can do where we can maybe avoid the use of herbicides and, and control the, the presence of beach? So we're not trying to eliminate beach, we just don't want it to dominate. That's a picture of Brett Chedzoy from 2019. I think he's standing in front of a red oak seedling that's shoulder high, which neither of us had ever seen. So that's pretty profound. So this is the first harvest we completed. It was 74 acres, you can see. It's called the gas line site. You can see that that straight diagonal line is a, is a buried natural gas right of way. You can see the skid trails and you can see that the slash is piled at the perimeter of the harvest. Here, all of this success to date has happened with mechanical operators. They're you know, mechanized logging crews. So they're using a feller buncher. They're not transporting slash across the harvest. They cut the stems. They put the tops on the perimeter, they put the low value material into the wall, and then snip off the merchantable stem. Now, when they're building the wall and they're at the perimeter, their highest priority, unless it's a high quality log, all woody material goes into that wall because the wall, you can't have a wall that's 99% done. It has to be 100% because the deer will find any, if there's an opening, the deer will find it and exploit it. So there are you know, there are low value saw logs that go into the wall if those, if those trees are positioned in proximity to the wall. The picture on the right is a picture of a red oak seedling, probably from late 2019. The scale stick is a, about a 30 inch scale stick, so we're looking at a stem that's six or seven feet tall. Um, and you can see some other desirable seedlings off to the right. So these were not seedlings. These were not seed origin. These were seedlings that were established uh, and that's why we could effectively do a clear cut. We have, uh, and I talked about earlier, I talked about AVID. So aviddeer.com is a protocol that we developed where you tag seedlings and track their height from one year to the next. And it's a very powerful way to assess whether or not you have deer impacts. Uh, and I would encourage you if this is, if you're wondering just how bad is my deer problem, this is a great way to do it. If you're interested, I can give you more information. What we see are red oak seedlings inside and outside the slash wall and sugar maple inside and outside the slash wall. So the red oak, uh, we see a couple of things. First, that the height growth is much greater on the inside than on the outside. After three years, we have double the height inside than outside. Uh, and these seedlings were mostly, um, were, were more or less randomly selected. We did not pick the biggest and best stems. So you can see growth rate of red oak outside, or I'm sorry, inside red oak growth rate and sugar maple growth rate inside are both much greater than outside. Um, the other thing to point out is that the first year, 2018, which is the crosshatch on the left for each species combination, the inside starting point was taller than the outside starting point. And that was because the protocol says anytime you have a disturbance, you wait a year before you start tagging and following ceilings. So this particular harvest was completed in June of 2017. We didn't tag these seedlings until June 
of 2018. So there was a year of growth inside the slash wall that provided the greater height advantage for the inside red oak and the inside sugar maple. The final point is that outside the slash wall, sugar maple is almost not growing. We have an inch and a half of growth. This is in well-lit conditions. Um, you can see that well-lit conditions inside the slash wall, in three years we had eight inches of height growth. And that's, and you can do better than that on some of these stems. So the moral of this story is that slash walls exclude deer. And we have other, kind of, we have these, these trials are um, augmented by fenced plots inside and outside so that we can truly document that there are no deer inside and that there are deer outside. We also wanted to know about changes in the dimensions of the wall. And uh, we had, in those initial harvests, we had three hardwood harvests and one red pine harvest. You can see the width, horizontal width, total height at the top, and um, height to a two inch diameter stem. What you can see is that there's essentially no change in width that you, you wouldn't expect that. We had specified the hardwood walls to be 10 feet wide. They ended up being about 20 feet wide just to get enough of a base. We specified the, the pine walls to be uh, 20 feet wide and they were about 25 feet wide. So essentially the 4%, 3% change are just measurement error. But over time you have roughly a 30% decline in height. But these are still um, four, five, four, five, eight feet tall and 20 feet wide, which as is an effective barrier. And after three years, deer have started recognizing the opportunity within that slash wall. The final thing we were looking at was what happens to beech. And so over this past summer, we were measuring the heights of a variety of different hardwoods uh, inside the slash wall. Well, if we had control plots were exposed and inside the slash wall as our treatments, you can see the beech on the left had uh, average height at the end of 2019 of about 30 inches or 37 inches. The majority of other species inside the slash wall are growing faster than American beaches. So we haven't eliminated beach, but by restricting the effects of deer, we have allowed for these other species to grow and to be competitive with beach. I'm analyzing the data to see the abundance of beach, which tends to be relatively low. So I've talked about this, uh, the mechanized directional felling, the slash is not transported. The other thing we did that I forgot to mention is we used that feller buncher has a, a continuously rotating blade, it's called a hot saw, and we paid them about $100 an acre to cut all of the stems. So it was a, like a brush, a brushing or a weed whacking of the forest. So I'm gonna jump ahead to the costs, um, I go back, so the average cost when you look at machine time works out to be about $1.47 a foot. When you add in the value of the wood that's left, and that's being very generous, the value of the wood is about 75 cents a foot. The average cost of the wall is 225. So it costs the, costs the logger about a dollar and a half, it costs the landowner who's losing wood, if you will, about 75 cents. Now you're losing wood if you have a market for low value trees. If you don't have a market, then, it's, then that's a non-issue. I can also say that there's essentially no maintenance um, and it works out to be about half the cost of fencing installation. You do have things to worry about. I'll refer you to slashwall.info. I realize I'm running over time. Or I'm, I guess I'm a couple of minutes past eight o'clock, not quite to 60 minutes. Um, and the lessons we've learned is that you need a logging crew that's going to buy into this, right? The, you're not going to force somebody contractually to do this. They have to believe in this. And we've been working with and providing training sessions to foresters and loggers. And there's, there's, a, there's a growing number of people that are really excited about this. We have uh, two other slash walls that have been built, one in New York, one in Rhode Island. We have three more that are in play one in Madison County, one in Shenango County, and one in Tompkins County. Uh, Connecticut is gonna put these up. Uh, there's interest in Michigan. And so this is, the idea is gaining some momentum. We did it as a negotiated bid. 
rather than a lump sum just because when the loggers are putting wood into the slash wall, it's a lot easier for them psychologically. And also there's a lot of cuttings. So just the cost of marking all of the cut trees, it's easier to mark the leave trees. So you still want to control what's left behind, or your forester does, uh, but then you cut everything else. So we're going to be looking at some different variations of this. We're going to ex experiment with small slash walls down to about five acres in size. We're going to look at some different timings of operations. So do you do an initial thinning before or after you build your slash wall? Uh, we're going to continue to monitor the longevity of the slash wall, look at some economic metrics, and work with people that we've been dealing with in Rhode Island and New York. Connecticut and Massachusetts. And then of course we'll be doing uh, continue to do extension events. So feel free to get in touch with us. Uh, you can see my phone number and email there. I think if you Google my name, you will be able to find my email address and we're happy to, if you have questions, you can email them or call me. I'm, I'll say I'm easier to reach by email, but I also have a um, pretty active research program and extension program. So I, I'll get back to you, but um, maybe not that day or the next day. So, and with that, I'm going to stop sharing and I will turn on my video. There we go. So I'm back. I can see the screen now and I'm happy to uh, answer questions. I'll, I can see the group chat. So let's see. All right, Fred says, you should mention the fabulous Northern Woodlands magazine. That is a great magazine. I agree, I, have, I, have, I enjoy that magazine. Uh, Fred also wants to get a copy of the slides. So I sent a PDF of this presentation to Alice and Jim. I think they received it. And those are um, available for you all. You can post them on your website. You can post this recording on your website. And we're working on a best practices guide for slash walls um, in case that's of interest. Um, Fred says, what are you harvested? harvesting? You mentioned harvesting. So uh, Fred, if you're still on, maybe you can clarify the question. The So when, when we're when we're harvesting and regeneration, we're going to be usually it's a se sequence of entries over the last 25 years of whatever you decide is the upper age of your woods. So with the Arnott Forest, we tend to grow an average to an average age of about 100 years. Now that's that's highly variable, but um, so we want to be thinking about regeneration at age 75 in those those management units. And the first thing that we would do would be to go in and do what's called a preparatory cut where we would we would thin, just gently thin, we would a very low intensity harvesting and we'd be cutting out species that we don't want to contribute to the seed bank, um, poor quality stems, we want to regulate some of the genetics and stem quality uh, and try and open up the understory a little bit. So it's it's going to be a low revenue harvest but it's going to be very impactful and that it's creating sunlight and it's creating growing conditions for the seeds that are going to be set. So that's at age 75. Then at about year 85 or 90, we would be thinking about, or maybe even 95, we would be thinking about doing what's called the seed cut. And that's where the seed cut is the removal of everything except the seed trees. And this would be what you would do in a seed tree harvest or in a shelter wood harvest. In a clear cut, so the seed tree and the shelter wood are what are called two entry or three entry. So you do a preparatory cut, seed cut, and then a final removal where you might do a couple of seed cuts. So a two, two entry or three entry. Um, drawing a blank, sorry. Um, so then you're gonna be removing a large volume and value because you're wanting to provide a lot of intense sunlight on the forest floor. And then after you have successfully gotten that regeneration layer up to about five feet of height or six feet of height, depending upon snow depths, 
then you would do that final overstory removal. And so at that point, you've officially restarted the next forest and you go, and that goes for the next 100 years. Um, and you would do the same, and that's whether you, all of these, the argument that I was trying to make, if it wasn't obvious, was that deer are a problem throughout New York State, except in very specific and unusual circumstances. Uh, in fact, I don't, I haven't been into a woodlot that's had a recent harvest that has not had evidence of deer impact. So I just, I haven't seen it. I'd love to see it. I haven't seen it, except where we have slash walls or fences. So for everyone to know how you measure the height of trees. Uh, so if it's, we're measuring seedlings and we're just doing an assessment of, are they high enough? I'm not quite, well, I like to think I'm six feet tall, maybe five, 11 and a half. Um, so, you know, if they're chin height, shoulder height, then they're probably high enough to be above deer. If you're trying to measure mature trees, there are ways that you can do that with a scale stick or with a clinometer. Okay, Sophie says, uh, an article, way to access. So I will send some links to Jim. Jim, you all would have registered for this, so Jim has uh, registration information. Um, let me type, let me see here. I can't, so just so you know, I can't type and talk at the same time. So if you go to my website, which is forestconnect.info, then there's a tab that's called publications or something like that, and then resources for educators, uh, you will find a series of fact sheets. And I will, I will send copies of PDF copies of those to Jim. Mark says, any suggestion for a small plot, say five acres, convert hemlock to hardwoods? What about future insects? Uh, yep, squirrels, chipmunks, and deer, oh my. Uh, so for five acres, that's too big for the five foot tall fence. You're probably going to have to go with a, like a six foot high, uh, six to seven foot high plastic mesh fence. Um, you can, we get fencing from either a, an online place called Deer Busters or Gemplers. And you buy, you can buy it as a 10 foot tall roll or an eight foot tall roll. You need high tensile wire at the top and at the bottom. And uh, we always use trees, low value trees. And the, the basic principle is that you attach uh, a, a rot resistant to like a pressure treated or a piece of black locust. You attach that to a low value tree. You drill a hole through the block. You have a fender washer, which is a large diameter washer with a small hole. And then you use a um, like a galvanized or an aluminum long nail. So I usually use three and a half inch galvanized nails. And then what happens, and then you attach the wire to that. You have one of those at the top and one of those at the bottom, about 12 inches off the ground. And then you have an apron that you weight down with logs and debris and rocks or whatever, because the deer, the deer can jump a seven foot fence, but uh, a five acre plot is a relatively small percentage of their home range and so it's not going to be something that there's going to be they're going to be feel pressured to get into and then you have you have to maintain it all right so jim's putting up some good examples for deer fencing there so i appreciate that any other questions So if anybody's interested in slash walls, so first of all, go to slashwall.info and you can, we have pictures there and we have video there. And I'd also welcome anybody to come to the Arnott Forest if you're in the area south of Ithaca, we're halfway between Ithaca and Elmira. They're right along the main roads. You can drive up and take a look at them. And um, we also, in late September every year, we have field tours and we take people in and discuss the, the current research results, which you just saw over the last 20 minutes, you saw an 
accelerated version of our most current research results. So we're very excited about slash walls. We recognize they're not for everybody, um, but what I tried to do in today's presentation was give a kind of a, a, an expanded view of strategies that can be used for a variety of different ownership objectives. Richard wants to know if there's a good source for tree seeds or seedlings. So the seeds, I'll say, I don't know of a seed source. Seedlings, I would start with um, by contacting the New York State DEC tree nursery. Um, and I would do that now. I mean, you're, you're, the common planting time is April or very early May. If you wait until March, they will have probably sold out. So if you just look up the New York State DEC tree nursery, or call your local DEC office, they can get you in touch. Another source is your local soil and water conservation district. Um, and different counties will source their tree seedlings um, to different places. So the, the local soil and water district might get some from the DEC, they might get some from other state nurseries. Uh, we also, we have a publication on uh, reforestation of northeastern forests or something like that. And we, we go into detail about aligning you know, which tree species are associated with particular soil types and the, the, the factors that you need to have uh, well established in order to uh, find success with your planting. Planting takes a lot of work. So we have the, the planting that I did was a, about a three acre parcel. I put in 800 research seedlings. I had, I had, I hired a crew to do all the maintenance of the vegetation and I just went in every year and kind of maintained everything, but it was, it was, um, it was a lot to keep track of. Jeff wants me to comment on the opportunities to use seedling planting to change species composition. That's one of the kind of the biggest attributes of artificial regeneration. So I would say if you've got, if you can regenerate any other way, if you can regenerate naturally, that's always an, an easier and typically more successful opportunity. The problem though, or one problem with natural regeneration is that if you don't have the species on site that you want to be part of the next forest. So uh, in that case you need to then you can buy the seedlings and plant them and maintain them. This is and, and where this is getting attention is as people think about projections of how the climate is going to change trying to uh, start planting more I'll say southern species. Uh, southern so I would I would like put an X through the southern species, uh, but rather would refer to it more as dry site species. And uh, because I think that's where you're gonna have more luck. So the southern species, until we have consistently southern climates, you may be able to get those southern species started, but it only takes one cold winter event once every five or 10 or 15 years, and you will get significant dieback in those southern species. Dry site species, you may have better luck with. So some of the hickories, um, uh, some of the oaks, you might, uh, that would be kind of a good transitory transitional species if you're looking for something that can be, you know, be successful in probably warmer and drier conditions. And I would try as, you know, if that's your goal, I would diversify as much as possible uh, just because it's hard to predict what those different species are going to do on those soils. And, and to the extent possible, you still have to match species to soil. Patrick says, within these plots, did you do scarification? You just rely on the harvester and skitters for the disturbance. So we did not do any deliberate scarification. Um, but the, the harvester was a tracked harvester, so it had metal tracks and it was a rubber tired grapple skitter. So there was a fair amount of soil scarification. It was fairly, you know, where the, where the, where the skitter ran, we, it was very clearly a skitter trail, but in the other areas, it was just a surface scarification. 
and because of that, it's that, that, so in those areas, like I showed you the red oak seedlings that were five or six feet tall, those were absolutely not um, acorns that came in during or after the harvest, which was, would have been in 2017. So those red oaks, those would have been acorns would have dropped in late 2017. And we took that picture two growing seasons later. And that, so you don't get a, red oak don't grow that fast unless it's a seedling that was already established and the seedling got damaged and then it sprouted. And, and that's what would have happened on that six foot tall seedling. Um, that, that area where we had those seedlings established was repeatedly thinned between 1985 and about 2010. So there were multiple entries, what we call an entry or thinnings that happened. And so those all would have had some amount of disturbance to the forest canopy. It would have allowed uh, some of those desirable species to establish that were subsequently browsed by deer but not killed. And it also allowed for a beach understory to develop. So we were, that was why we had the logging crew, what we call brush the understory. So they used that big um, circular a continuously spinning blade to essentially as a weed whacker in the forest. And we paid them, so that's a cost, right? It takes them extra time. Uh, we paid them, we pay them a dollar and a half per foot for the wall based on a, to go out with a GPS and walk the perimeter of the wall. And we say, this is how many feet it is. And we, on a per acre basis, we have pre-inventory data and we adjust the uh, payment for brushing based on the density of stems. So if you get up above, you know, we'll pay 100 to 100, and usually we're at the upper ends about 125 an acre if you're with, you know, if you're talking about three to 500 stems per acre. Most of these are less than 200 stems per acre, and so we're, we're paying $100, 50 to $100 per acre. We haven't really fine-tuned that payment schedule. Well, lacking any further questions, I think that'll wrap us up. Um, thanks everybody for coming and thank you, Peter. It was great and boy, are, are we lucky to have folks like you out there doing this kind of research um, so that, so that uh, our landowners know what they can do. Um, so just thank you for all that too. Well, like, I, I, I'm, I'm thankful to the woodland owners out there because you all make it fun and, and you keep it exciting for me. So that's, uh, that's, a, that's a real joy. It looks like... I'd like to uh, just add, I'd like to add to, to uh, what Jim said. And that is, you know, when you have Zoom, you can't get to hear everybody applaud and thank you. So on behalf of everyone here, I'd like to thank you for coming and talking with us. And it's truly a pleasure to have the benefit of your expertise. Well, thank, I appreciate that very much. Thank you. So I appreciate you all taking your evening to, uh, to sit and listen and ask questions. So it was fun. All right. Thank you. Good night, everybody. All right. Thank you all. Have a great evening. Have fun in the woods. Be safe. <laughs>